And next candidate, uh, Niall Cooper, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Nick. Good to see you. And you. And thank you very much for standing for election this year to the Dons Trust Board. We will start out gently. <laughs> Give us a bit of background on yourself. What do you do? What's your day-to-day -day job? Whereabouts are you based? Sure. I'm uh, Head of Media, PR and Support Communications at Amnesty International UK. Backgrounds. Um, well, I started going to Wimbledon in 1982. I was a mascot and Robert Dale loves, the, loves pulling out the old mascot picture of me and my brother from 1983. Um, so if anybody wants to look at that, you can find us. We did lose that game, so that's a bad omen. But um, that's that. And then obviously I was involved in Yellow and Blue, written a couple of books on the club, um, massively involved with the uh, uh, external media for the uh, Don's... Um, for the Palin Bond, which I was really happy with that, really, really chuffed about that. So lots of lots of good things there. And that's kind of my big background, really, then. It... Can you remember which actual game was the first fixture you attended? I'm just, I'm bad over for everybody. It was Scunthorpe United. It was 2-2. We were 2-0 up uh, September 1982. Um, so we did, we did win the league that year. And our second game, we won 6-1. And uh, I think Wally Down scored a couple or something like that. My brother remembers it far better than me because um, I like to stress that he is, in fact, older than me, even though I'm normally grey hair. <laughs> um, I'm saying nothing about brothers being older with... Anyway, yes, let's not get into that conversation. <laughs> um, it's dangerous, right? It, very, it really is. Uh, Favourite Wimbledon player of all time, then, over your... I won't say how many years that is, supporting the club. <laughs> Too many. Uh, Stuart Evans was my first favourite player. And then I think... Over time, it's, it's Robbie Earl. Um, you know, easily, in my opinion, the best Wimbledon player of all time. How he didn't play for England, I don't know. Um, great pride in the fact he scored the uh, first goal for Jamaica in the 98 World Cup. But I just think an absolute legend, fantastic player. And um, I think it's between him and Alan Cork for favourite player so far today. On the I would encourage questions. everybody else to vote for Robbie Earl. So <laughs> I, know, I think Charlie's lurking somewhere, but yeah, Robbie Earl, Robbie Earl, Charlie, okay. Uh, I think he's got I think he's got the message um, I, I fear he might go for somebody else and I might know who that is but anyway um, on to your manifesto then um, you standing for election and would it be fair to say your main motivation for standing is based on fan ownership and maintaining the structure as it is not maintaining the structure as it is um, well that's within the Don's Trust in terms of fan ownership absolutely 100% um, the one thing I think we need to do is compare ourselves to other models, other clubs. You know, we are not going to be the best at being Liverpool. We are not going to be the best at being Man United, but we can be the best at being AFC Wimbledon. And what that means is really looking at how we're different and how we're unique and what appeals to people beyond our fan base. And that's the fact that we're fans owned. You know, that's the fact that we're not taking all that corporate dollars and all the rest of it, but we are having that ability. And that's what John Green likes us that's why you know there's so much more potential out there you look at the don's local action group and the success it's had in reaching out to the community and when i was doing stuff on the palin bond and you're speaking to loads of other people or even doing the research for this post and looking at all the other people i spoke to um consistently there's a love for us there's a real love for us women and it's because we're fans owned we have such an opportunity to take that on and become even better. You know, there is no other club that really can challenge our story. And we need to celebrate that. We need to push that. And that fans ownership is right at the heart of it. You know, anybody who's an AFC Wimbledon fan has been an AFC Wimbledon fan. Why are you an AFC Wimbledon fan? You're an AFC Wimbledon fan because we say FU, FA, we want, we believe in fans ownership. We don't want that old model. Um, you know, and that's, that's where I see the future of us and the future of us being really successful and moving on. So when I talk about structure, I talk about percentage of ownership for the Donald's board and the voting rights currently 83%. You hinted there, perhaps you are pushing for some structural change of, of some description. What would that be? I think one of the things is, I said, Nick, I mean, like I spent a lot of time with a bunch of women and fans looking at what was wrong. Except the last year, when we nearly sold up, scared the living daylights out of me. You know, I probably rested on my laurels, thought, right, everything was rosy, and it wasn't. 
and we needed to think right, what needs to change. And when you look at the review that the Don's Trust Board commissioned and it came back, there's a lot of very good things in that, which is basically we have too many boards. We have a blurry structure system about who's in charge of what and what the roles and responsibilities are. And listening to Hannah just now, she echoes that. And I think that needs to be really sorted out. When I look at, the, I've spoken to a few people on the board now, and I've spoken to a few other candidates, and I look at the likes of Hannah and Luke and Graham, and you think, how much could they have done if they'd have had a real free reign to run media and be really free on the communications and actually be much more proactive? There's so much potential in those three alone of what they could do. And then I listen to Jane, and Jane talks about diversity and inclusion and about how we could reach out to more people in the community and grow beyond our communities, make everybody feel welcome at AFC Wimbledon. And that's fantastic too, but she needs to be empowered. She needs to feel like she can actually do that and feel like there's no other barriers and that she's got the power to do that. And that's where I think we need to look as a structure to really put in some really strong roles and responsibilities and empower people to make really active change. Let's be dynamic. Um, you know, you look at all the things that have happened over the last year and how fans have reacted. We've got such momentum. We've got such brilliant fans who have brilliant set of networks. Let's reach out to them. Let's use them all. Um, I say my manifesto, it's not about me. It's about us. You know, I'm not, I'm one individual. If you ask me what I think I can do that's different, what I offer that's new, it's, I'd want everybody on the, who stood as a candidate to have an active role. I'd want fans beyond that to look at what they can do, what networks do they have so that we strive to become not, you know, to be the best on the pitch, you need to be the best off the pitch. And we need to find the best people in every role, every position we look at and find them. And I don't know them all, but there are a lot of AFC Wimbledon fans out there. That's a huge lot of Don's Trust members out there. And they will know the best fundraiser, the best HR person, the best, um, I don't know, barman even or whatever. You know, we need to find all these best people and bring them in, make them feel part of a brilliant community, which we can be. Um, and that's where I, you know, we scratch the surface with the Don's Play First Action Group. We scratch the surface with the Blowing Bond. There is so much more we can do and we can be... Um, one great club together and, and reach out beyond that as well. I'm so enthusiastic about this, honestly. <laughs> over the last, you know, six months or whatever it has been, you know, doing, developing, you know, people know that we've got a Don's Trust manifesto.com that we put together. And originally that was an idea just to throw some ideas out there. And then everybody kept on nagging the people putting behind that. And I was one of those four or five people that were involved. And one of you's got to stand on it if you actually believe in it, you know, that's where my hat got thrown in the ring because you know we're kind of going like this is it's there's so much more we can do there's so much passion out there so much drive and it's brilliant and that's what i've wanted to take on to the board you mentioned existing board members there and things that you think if they'd had free reign to do to go ahead to maximize their skills but is that in you cite hannah and luke at the media side of things is that not something that's more of a hands-on role is that what you foresee in the future of changing the structure as opposed to the oversight role of the sort of the steering committee's aspect of, uh, of the board? I think when you're talking about comms is different a bit. And the reason why comms is different is because you're talking about a Don's trust line. So if we can get somebody that is empowered and trusted to deliver a Don's trust line, then basically it's just ultimately sign off and having one person who's responsible to sign off on the behalf of the whole of the Don's trust board. So you mandate somebody to say, right, you have that, ability of signing off um, and the reason why I say that's important is it's about trust it's about actually delegating people to do that so that we can be dynamic if it if it, we run things constantly by a massive committee we're going to slow down when we don't need to be slowing down um, you know I I've heard stories about what the frustrations that Hannah Luke and Graham have had and other people as well and it seems ridiculous that we should have that level of frustration when it comes to responding to things that the FA are doing or the Premier League are saying or what are things that are just kind of really should be core Don's Trust values. Um, and we need to be quick on that. You know, as a person who worked in the news media for a long time, if you send out a, a response a week later, it's, it's nobody's going to hear it or nobody's going to, it goes nowhere. It doesn't make us part of a narrative, part of an ability to change and part of an ability 
to make a statement. Uh, and we are a statement. You know, we are a statement. Let's not forget about it. AFC Wimbledon is a massive statement in the world of football. You know, we're two fingers up to the likes of Chelsea, Arsenal, Spurs, Liverpool, Man United, the FA, the Premier League, all of that. You know, we're a massive thorn in the side of it. And we are saying, because we say, hold on, your model is rubbish. You know, your model, it doesn't, it's not good. We've got a far better model. Um, I'm going to quote Chris Stewart. He's probably listening in. And apologies, Chris, for nicking your line. But you liked it, right? It was, um, the thing with owners is they do three things. Sorry, Chris, it's such your favourite quote on it. Um, they either get bored, they go bust, or they die, and then what? Right? And that's the case at every football club, apart from the few that are fans owned, because we're still here. You know, we're still here. We're, we are a statement. We are a different. We are, you know, and you know, you, somebody else mentioned the question, we are a movement. That's, that, you know, that's it. You know, we're different. And we should celebrate our difference and we should really champion it and use it and encourage people. There are so many people that love our story. You know, that we, we should be, you know, when, when you talk to people, I, you know, saying, like, well, do you want to do a discussion series on AFC Wimbledon and like that sort of stuff? We were doing it. And it was not difficult to get people to come on. It really wasn't. You know, it really wasn't because they're saying, I want a piece of that. I want to be part of that story. I want to be part of that. We should be outreaching to all of those people and making it so that when people come into, you know, I spoke to some of the other candidates, Roger, who you had on this morning, who was talking about that experience of coming down into, um, into the stadium and making it feel like, wow, there's this whole atmosphere, the whole kind of, you're going to the venue, you're going to it as like an actual, you go there as like, it's an event, it's a place, it's kind of like something niche, it's brilliant. That sort of thing. You want people to come in and feel part of, part of our story, part of our, you know, history. You know, I'd, I'd advocate a massive community outreach program celebrating our history. You know, do partnerships with schools. Whereas, you know, I was talking to a few people behind the scenes for quite a while about doing massive history projects. I know Luke Hunt Kelly is doing stuff with a couple of other people. It's brilliant. Um, to where you have people might read that check to my of the book, which is all my book, which is all fan stories or player stories. Get the kids in the local schools to read that out, record it, and get them meeting the person who said that story at Paolo. You know, actually create something that is intergenerational. Get people loving the story, identifying with those fans, identifying with those players, identifying with those stories within our communities. You know, really, there is such a brilliant story out there, and we need to tell it, and we need to get people really proud of Wimbledon and what we've achieved within Wimbledon, within Merton, within London, and actually within the UK, because it's with we have so much that we can offer and so much that can inspire. I talk too much, Nick. <laughs> Not at all. But I was going to, I mean, I will just have one more question for you before we get on to, to viewers' questions. But it's, it's the point you make there about bigger clubs. Uh, you reeled off Manchester United, Liverpool, Tottenham, all those who have, have different models to ours. I want to link that to our ambition as a football club on the pitch. You, you talked about to be successful on the pitch, you need to be successful off the pitch. You've talked a lot about things that we can do to improve community links and be a valuable asset in the community. But at the same time as that, you've also said in your manifesto that you think people that say remaining fan owned limits our ambition is, is rubbish. So why is, why is that rubbish? But also on the, on the flip side of that, when we're talking about what we can do with our ownership model, is us progressing to the Premier League to try and compete with the Liverpools that you say we're not? Why is that? Is that desirable? Do we want to be going that far? Uh, Nick, there'll be fans out there that will love us to be back in the Premier League. You know, let's, you know, mm. but where I say talk about fan ownership, where do we start? We started on with no pitch, no players, no kit, nothing. We got promoted six times in eighteen years. We now have our own stadium. Awesome achievement. That is ambition, but we can go further. And I talk about that uniqueness, about if you're a big, you know, I've talked to a lot of fundraisers over the last few months, a lot of people that could actually, would be interested in trying to chase down big sponsors to bring in money into the club and back us because we are not a normal football club. We're a different football club. If we say we're going to be trying to do the Liverpool, Man United, or even Charlton or wherever, you know, you're competing with all those sort of people on their ethics and on their kind of value. And that's, you know, that's what their fundraising teams will be doing. That's what their merchandising team will be doing. We have a different story to tell. And that's, we need to keep that values right at the heart of us. So fan ownership, community spirit, 
a kind of unique ethos. That's what appeals. And that's a whole new revenue stream that we can get into and tap into more than any other club because we're unique. And that's the bit we can chase. That's the extra revenue that could help us push us up the leagues and make us more successful on the pitch as well as off it. But we need to be true to that. The more we waver from fan ownership, the more we waver from being a community club, the less, actually the less likely we are to be successful because then we're just competing with every other ordinary club and we're not every other ordinary club and we need to stay being not an ordinary club. That's our route to success, not in fact a way of hindering it. It's a way to deliver it. Thank you, Nart. At this juncture, I will hand over to George. We've got a lot of questions coming in from viewers and uh, George, take it away. Okay, first question. Um, talking about the yellow and blue Zoom discussions you've held over the last couple of months, what was the single most important takeaway you got from those discussions? Two, um, Lucy Seagull, who said, don't ever lose your uniqueness. Keep your uniqueness going. That's what keeps you special. That's what makes you different. That's the bit that's actually going to drive you on. Um, she also talked about reaching out to young fans and young supporters and remembering where our next generation is. What are they interested in? And we need to appeal to that whole new generation, otherwise we'll die out. And we need to think about what are they caring about? What's, what matters to the young generation now? Um, you know, I've got a few things, but like I mentioned to Nick earlier on, unfortunately my hair's quite great. And I was a mascot in 1983, which gives you the sense that I couldn't really get away with calling myself young anymore. So we need to really engage young fans. We need to get them and get their views. And young people who aren't fans. See, what would make you feel about AFC Wimbledon? What makes AFC Wimbledon special? What would you like to see at a ground? That's what's going to secure our future. And let's really embed those. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to envisage like change tomorrow, but I think if we can get long-term benefits and long-term support, so there's a long-term path that means that we are secure way beyond. And we don't have the ups and downs of the Charlton Athletics, the Wiggins, the South Ends, all those clubs that have chased something and then folded because they've got an owner that suddenly says, oh, screw you. Um, we need to have a community club that's really embedded in the secure, and secure, and that means reaching out to all those people. That was my big takeaway. Apart um, from what I like talking to John Scales, I quite like. Yeah. Um, another question is, uh, what would be your one main priority that you would like to achieve in your time on the board if you get on? I think, guys, so dull. I wish I didn't have to say this. Not dull, it's really, really, really important. Roles and responsibilities, George. You know, really, we need to get that sorted. We need to get to a situation where, like I mentioned all those other names, they, can, they really know what they're doing and we have objectives for them. So when you come and say, right, what did you try and achieve? Well... Jane, you've got diversity inclusion. This is your objective to try and achieve in two years' time. You are empowered to do that. But she can only really do that if we've got very strong roles and responsibilities for her that are clear. The same goes for uh, Tim. Tim talk, talking about stuff he might want to do with speaking out and developing fans' movement stuff, right? That's the same. Give him some strong objectives and say, Tim, go away and do that. Achieve that. We're giving you that remit, but you can only do that with roles and responsibilities. New people coming onto the board, new people coming in. Let's see that transparency so you know what we're doing and we can reach out and have the best people in every single role that we go so that we don't have people rushing around going, oh, we've got to put together this show or do that program or whatever, trying to find people without necessarily looking for the best people or advertising out that. That said, Charlie did a brilliant job. I know he's next on. Charlie did a brilliant job with that program. And it's awesome. That should have been something that the, the uh, club should have spotted and said, right, this is what we need to do. Let's commission somebody to do it. Let's have an open, transparency way of doing it. And we will produce the best thing. Charlie did a fantastic job. But Charlie did it off his own back, more or less. I mean, he'll tell you more about it in a minute. But those sort of things, I want to have the best people in every role that we have advertised. I'll talk and to you. Sorry. One final question. Um, Obviously, it's about the restricted actions. At the moment, the threshold for a restricted action to pass is 75% of the vote. Do you think that's right? Do you think that needs to be higher? Or do you think it should be reduced? You know, this is a, a really interesting question because I don't think people really understand what restriction actions are. Right? I think there's a whole dummy guide to a loads of kind of stuff that we need to make it really clear to people know what we mean. Now, 
as far as I understand about restriction actions, it's like we have certain things that are crown jewels, certain things that we should never lose. And for me, the bar needs to be really high on those. So that's like moving out of the stadium, the name of the club, all the, those sort of elements. Um, is 75% high enough? Do you know, George, I'm not sure. I probably personally nudge it higher. But I freely admit on that, that we're a members organization. And that bit is where I think we'd have to take it to the members to see whether we think that is the case and that those levels are at the right point. I'd advocate for higher, um, because I think it's so fundamental to what we're talking about. You know, and for me, you know, it ties in with the, the little about 75% ship, 75% fan ownership, similar sort of question, right? Can't go below that for me. That's an absolute no, because that's who we are. That's our ethos. That's our bit that makes us unique. That's the bit that makes us special. We lose that and we start becoming like every other football club. And we, we're not every other football club. And I don't want us to be like every other football club. I love our story. I love our history. I love what we've achieved. And, uh, you know, we only do that if we protect the, the things that's, that are essential to us. And that is the, some of the restricted action stuff, George. So, you know, we need to make sure that they stay there. Otherwise, you know, we're just like, I don't know, uh, Crew Alexandra. Crew Alexandra's a great club, but like, you know, we're different. We're different. I actually don't want to be Chelsea either, by the way, or Liverpool or Man United. I want to be AFC Wimbledon. I want to be the best at being AFC Wimbledon. Um, and that's where I think those restricted actions and the level of fan ownership is 100% essential. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Yes, I just echo that. Nobody wants to be Chelsea by any stretch of the imagination. But Niall, <laughs> Sorry, Nick. Thank you. That's a bad example. <laughs> uh, well, well, no, I can think of one worse. But anyway, uh, Niall, thank you very much for I your... I can't say those words, Nick. No, I know. I realise. I realise. <laughs> thank you very much for uh, taking time to speak to us. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everybody, for listening. And all the best for the for the election. We wish you well.